Here we are at Painted Rock, the old wise guys. Our very first guest, Larry Lundgren, the only guy who shows up on friggin' time. How you doing, Larry? I'm doing just great. Yeah. Drove all the way down from Vernon just to see you and uh, hear about the uh, old wise guys. See that? We are celebrities. You guys are going to have a great time today. Okay, we're here at Painted Rock with two new guests. Aaron. Adam. And you, know, you notice the car in the background? Yes. It's very nice. Whose is that? It's not mine. I know. <laughs> it's the owner. The one you're going to be induced to later on today, John Skinner himself. Very nice. I was wondering why he got his own parking spot. Okay, now we have Melody with us. And what brought you here today? Well, I heard this uh, winery is fantastic in location, and I'm excited to taste the different wines. You sure it wasn't the incredible company of the old wise guys? Because that's what I yes. think it was. Yes, it was, definitely. We're the old wise guys, hosted by the finely matured, full-bodied dads. Yes, we do enjoy our wine and our scotch. Our goal is to tell interesting and funny stories on diversified topics from our generation's point of view. We hope that you find them a good experience and hopefully some entertainment. So, this is an extremely special podcast today. And if you're listening to this, I suggest strongly you go to YouTube and look us up, The Old Wise Guys, because we are actually doing this live from Painted Rock in, in Penticton, BC. And we are so happy to be here. This is, uh, this is um, uh, Rex's and my uh, favorite winery in the Valley. We're both members here, and we are just thrilled to have the owner of the establishment actually do a podcast today for a live uh, wine tasting and story about this fantastic winery. So if you're coming down this way, I highly recommend you come down, make sure you play some golf, and look at some winery, because that we've been doing the past three days, and I've had nothing but fun. So thank you, Medley and David. Hanker. It's my turn. It's your turn, Hanker. You're done talking. That's excellent. Hello, everybody. I am Hank. I am uh, one of the better looking ones here, of course. Uh, oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? You gotta put your thing in. I'm actually drinking, already started drinking a, a wine that everybody's going to taste at some point. It's their blend. Unbelievable. So I'm going to let John, when he gets to his chance to show it off it is fantastic something i want to tell everybody today or actually not today this week july 30th one coming up is also world friendship day so today we've invited all of our friends right all right so we're all good <laughs> However, the track on the wise guys uh on this is that uh, we're at painted rock and the olympics is on so i guess we should say that it's appropriate to say imagine all the people living for today from john lennon Oh and my God! Yeah, Are you something? serious? That's what you came up with. Yeah, yeah. It was the best I could do. Imagine sure. all the yeah, people. No, like, exactly. You could have sang that. It'd be better. Sharing, sharing the world. Sharing the world. Absolutely. Yet no one's allowed to go in the stadiums. No. Okay, Rex. Oh boy, oh boy! I'm so excited to be here, gentlemen. I. Uh, we got up this morning in smoky, smoky, smoky Kamloops, British Columbia. We jumped into the uh, 370Z and we didn't take the top off because it was so smoky. I said to my lovely wife, don't worry, as soon as we get over the hill, we'll take the top off and we'll enjoy the ride. Well, we got all the way to Penticton and we still didn't take the top off. And uh, that's just the way it is around here right now. Penticton's in a lot better shape than Kamloops, but um, that's the way it goes. Rex, I, I think you have a little white lie there. I'm hearing from your wife that you didn't want to put the top down because it was going to mess up her hair. Too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's just right. That sounds close to the right? truth. Right? Isn't that, that closer to the like truth? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, doesn't she look beautiful? Oh, oh yeah. All right. So to the no instruction needed uh, a nation, uh, you're going to really enjoy this um, because we're going above the beer into the wine now. So that's the refinement of the old wise That's right. Guys. We, we're going to move them up a level. We're moving them up a level. We are wise. Right? The, the instruction need podcasts are the younger version of us. And 
they like to talk a lot about sports and their sports sports heroes. And although I do like their sports heroes, I can tell you that I have a hero, and it's John Skinner, <laughs> because John has built this incredible winery over the years, and I am just so thrilled. This is like this is like me going to see Wayne Gretzky. That's that's what this feels like for me. That's that's how much. And then he drives up in this Porsche. Like like I was couldn't have asked for a better introduction. Now John was a stockbroker in Vancouver for more than twenty five years. During which time he became an avid wine enthusiast. John and his wife Trish um, dreamed of having their own vineyard after spending time visiting wineries in south of France with their family. So it's with great pleasure. I'd like to induce John to take us through his vineyard, history of the vineyard, and the beautiful wine tasting we're about to experience. John. Well, thank you. you very much. I'm honored to have you here. It's uh, honestly, as a small family business, getting, um, having the opportunity to, to get in front of people. The most amazing thing of this journey is how personal everything is. Um, I've spent the last probably 17 years building a community. And, and it, for me, I, I guess the primary motivation that I had was, was to, to contribute to the Okanagan wine region, building a bigger profile internationally. And my simple investment risk or bet was uh, if the Okanagan was well-renowned for producing the finest fruit, and we produce incredibly good fruit because it has hot days and cool nights, creates the acidity, and it's very, very unique in our fruit producing capabilities. And my bet was if all of the fruit that I've tasted is so spectacular, perhaps we can produce the finest premium wine grapes. So the journey began, I retired in 1997 for the first time I was 39. And my wife looked at me and said, you better find something to do or we're not going to make it. That was after a couple of years. <laughs> totally serious. I'm flying to Vegas on weekends and doing stupid things. And, yeah. and so I was kicking around the idea in the late 90s about I had a friend of mine, I have a very dear friend, Ray Cinarello, built a winery down in Napa Valley. He's on Silverado Trail. And, and I watched him build it with this really deliberate mandate for quality. And, and it was take no prisoners. He brought in international consultants. They really did what they have to. And now those wines are, you know, some of them are like 150 US a bottle. It's a great success story. And I thought if somebody, having observed that, success, I thought if somebody applies the same mandate in the Okanagan, um, there's a really good opportunity to contribute to the region getting better. I think one of the biggest advantages I ever had in this journey is know what you don't know. And in my brokerage business, I, I think if I had one success, again, it's know what you don't know and surround yourself with good people. And, and what I would do in the underwritings that I would do is I would hire people who understood the political risk and some of these ventures that I was doing. Some people would understand the geological risk. And, and essentially what I did was I handicapped risk. So when I started Painted Rock, I thought, okay, it's anchored and based on the terroir. It's primary, the dirt first, okay? So it's your, your only limitation in this journey is going to be um, what are the limitations of the, of the dirt that you own? So I said, I, I hired a team and I said, I want to buy the best dirt in the Okanagan. And it could be an existing winery, it could be not. And we looked at probably 34 different projects over four years before we found this place. And I found a whole bunch of nine and a half out of tens and no tens because there'd be some issue, whether it's air movement or heat units or soil consistency, or there are a million different uh, issues that you have to handicap. And, and I just kept on saying, no, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. And I didn't do it and it wasn't a cost thing. It wasn't a, it just, there are no two properties alike here. Like everything is subject to some ch difference. So when I found, I was gonna give up and I was flying back to Vancouver. I've been back and forth many times. I was flying back to Vancouver and I was, uh, with Cynthia Enns, she and her husband David used to own uh, Laughingstock. Big success. And I was with Cynthia flying back to Vancouver, and I told her I was giving up. Couldn't find it. And I said, I'm not buying a nine and a half. You know, if, if there's going to be some limitation, I just didn't want that. And she said, before you give up, you got to talk to this guy. And she introduced me to a guy who used to be in the brokerage business in Toronto, who had middled more transactions in the industry than anybody. And he wasn't a realtor. He, wasn't, he just was really interested. So I called him. And we talked for half an hour and we had a lot of similar interests, knew a lot of the same people. And he said, okay, you're the guy. And I said, what do you mean I'm the guy? And he said, there's a property 
in Penticton that ha is for sale and it's just so problematic that nobody will touch it. It used to be the largest apricot orchard in the British Commonwealth and it was very famous for that, called the Black Hawk. And I said, okay. And he said, but during the gypsy moth infestation of the 1980s, if you were part of the problem, the government would come in and take your orchard down. They came in and they took down 800 trees and left the stumps. So I'm looking at this thing thinking, okay, here's an opportunity. So what did I do? I flew Ray Signorello up. It was the beginning of January. And the year previous, I was down at his vineyard and I'm standing on Silverado Trail looking over his infinity edge pool. And I said, Ray, you own the most beautiful property in the world. It was really amazing. Six months later, we're standing at the top of my property looking down over the snow down to the lake. And I said, Ray, you own the second most beautiful property <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and it was, it was, but under new, when, so, so the snow goes away and there are 800 stumps here. And that becomes the issue. So again, getting back to know what you don't know, I brought in a team and I said, what do we do? And they said, you got two choices. You can bulldoze all those stumps to one end and get rid of them in a week and destroy the property because you homogenize the topsoil into the alluvial silt layer and you will destroy your terroir. Or you can peel the topsoil back, you can remove the stump, you can re repair the alluvial silt layer and put the topsoil back and do that 800 times. It's gonna take you a year. I said, okay, let's do it. I lived in West Vancouver and I wasn't gonna be here. And it, for me, it was just, if I paid X for the property, it was X plus whatever that was gonna cost me. But the, the big advantage of that was extraordinary, and that was, it was gonna take us a year. So if it's gonna take us a year, my consultants all said, well, wow, we've, everybody that buys a property, they just plant it right away, and they plant what their uncle likes, they plant whatever, like there's, it gave us a year for due diligence. So we put a weather station with the property, we put sensors everywhere, and the strategic planting was absolutely so focused that all these years later, my Bordeaux consultant walked the vineyard with me a couple of years ago and he said, would you change anything? And I said, I wouldn't change a plant and neither would, and he said, neither would I. Well, this guy, he, Alain Sutra consults to Petrus, he consults to Chateau Becheval, he's at the top of the food chain and this is his passion project. So I was given a grocery list of all these clones and varieties that I'm gonna plant. Like we'd discovered at the very north when you're going around the corner past the sculpture there, there's a planting block that's planted in a different direction. Well, we realized that on average, that area was on average four degrees Celsius cooler than the planting block right beside it. And, and we wondered, I thought this, there was something wrong with the sensors. And then we realized it's not the sensors, it's influenced by something different than this whole property is, and it's the cool breeze that comes down the creek. When he came onto my property, he drove across a creek. That influences, so we actually planted it in a direction that would move that air in a diff more accommodate the air movement where the air that moves here is influenced from the mountains behind us. So when the sun goes down, there's a cold breeze that sweeps straight through the vineyard and that, um, that creates your acidity. So you want consistency. So I'm get, now I'm employing Valerie Tate and I am her biggest fan. Like she's the viticulturist that devised the planning strategy. And uh, she had two clones of every variety and two rootstocks so that you have complexity and, and it's really important. So she, she devised this planning strategy that was going to avail our ultimate winemaker with a full suite of blending opportunities. So um, all the five primary Bordeaux varietals and then we did a Syrah and then we did a Chardonnay. So the only white we produce is a Chardonnay just in that cooler part of the property. So I'm given this whole list of clones to get. So I go to the, the local purveyor of all these and I said, can you get me these? And he said, I'll be back to you in a week. So a week later, I get a call from him and he said, okay, I can get everything you need. I said, really? I thought I'd heard word that it was difficult to get certain clones. And he said, well, I can't get you clone 99 and 100 of, of Syrah. I can get you clone 88 and 144. They're almost as good. And I can't get you these two clones of Cab Sova. I can get you these two. They're almost as good. And I said, okay, I spent four years looking for the right property. I spent a year analyzing everything about it. And you're going to plant almost as good? Not a chance. Okay, you give me the name and the number of that nursery owner. I want to phone the guy. And he was reluctant. For a week, I worked on him. I said, just come on, let me call, let me call the guy. So finally, he, he gives me his number. And I used to live in northern Quebec for two years when I was a kid. I lived, my father's a fighter pilot in the Air Force. And, and uh, so we lived at Bagotville. And I learned to speak the worst guttural French on the planet. Like, it was just terrible. But all I remember are the swears. But anyway, 
So I pick up the phone and I call this guy, and in my terrible French and his terrible English, I bribed him. I bought 65,000 plants, I paid him a buck a plant more, and I got everything I wanted. And, well, fast forward, when, when we hung up, who does the nursery owner phone? He phones Alain Sutra. Alain Sutra was the consultant that used to come here in the 90s. He worked for the Merlot family. It's not spelt like the wine Merlot, but it, it's a family that owns six, six wineries in France. And they were joint venture partners, or are joint venture partners, with um, Vincor, and they produced a Suisse La Rose. So who did they send over but their consultant, Alain Sutra. So the nursery owner phones Alain Sutra and said, you should go back to the Okanagan. This guy's blowing his brains out. <laughs> and that was how I met Alain. So a year later, he came here, and he walked the vineyard with me. And he said, he looks at me, and he said, he had some observations. He said, who decided to plant east-west? And I told the story of, it's, it's, it's quite unique because most people plant north-south. The sun comes up in the east, goes down in the west, affects the fruit equally. But uh, Valerie's position was plant east-west because you can always deal with this, the amount of sun that the fruit gets with leaf removal on the north side. You can never do anything about air movement, and air movement is more important. So when the sun goes down and that cool wind comes down and sweeps the heat off, it equally creates your acidity. And that was the most important thing. When Alain heard this story, this was my first exam because he said, who decided to plant east-west? And I told him the story. And he said, it's genius. Oh, God. Wow. It's the first Fantastic. time I ever, so that was my first exam. Did I, because I actually had two consultants working for me. One said plant north-south and one said plant east-west. They were arguing one day and I, I said, let's go to lunch. One of you is going to work for me after lunch. And that was it. So they, they had that discussion. And the guy was all about, oh, no, it has to be because the sun, this, 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 this. And then finally, Valerie put up with this for 45 minutes. And then finally she said, it should be east-west because of all these things. When you get really cold temperatures in the winter, it's going to affect the first row differently than the second row, differently than the third row. All these things. And then she said, and you know this property that you so perfectly took care of when you, when you prepared it? You're going to have to terrace it. You're going to destroy this whole place. And I said, Paul, <laughs> see you later. Good to know you. <laughs> <Sayonara>. <laughs> Pay the bill on the way out. Yeah, it's all good. Um, I got to share that story at a winemaker dinner a couple nights ago. And honestly, and Valerie was there. And honestly, all these years later, I was just so honored to be able to say that because this, this place has over-delivered on its promise. We have never had, there hasn't been a negative that has appeared on this journey. Um, anything that we've discovered has been to the positive. It's, it's the fact that it's got a six degree slope that moves air constantly. You never see us bird net. You know why? Those rocks up there, that rock cliff is full of hawks. So those are employees of mine. There's not a flock of birds that will come here. They, they get rid of the snakes. They get rid of the rodents. Um, there's everything that we've like, and, and bird netting is a big labor initiative. We don't do any of it. Plus it's optically, it's much nicer without it. So, so, um, I make a deal with Alan and I've been bringing him over every second month for 15 years and he is fabulous. So what I've done since is I'm all about making the Valley better. I'm president of a new association called the Okanagan Wine Initiative and we are the seven most aggressive exporters. And instead of painted rock, I've got six distributors in Europe and I'm all over the place, but I don't want to be on a wine list where it's pages of Bordeaux, pages of Burgundy, and then an others page. I want there to be an Okanagan page. The idea is let's grow and win business as a community, as opposed to competing against one another. Because this industry was all about competing. When it was a, a farm gate driven industry, when I first got in, People didn't compliment and refer to one another really. It was, it was a little bit, I saw it as being it's a tiny bit toxic. And now we're just of a different mind. We, now we've grown, I think there were 60 wineries when I started, there's 350 now, or 325 or some number like that. It's, it's huge. But now it's about getting that name on the international stage. I've got six distributors in continental Europe. One of the biggest challenges when I first went over 10 years ago, was they'd walk up to my table, I was at Provine, where, and there's a Canadian pavilion, and they'd come over and say, ice wine? <laughs> I'd say no, <laughs> no. So I'd, I, I, I decided the next year what I was going to do is I'd bring a picture of this place. And like, it just was mind-boggling how, how shocked a lot of the consumers were because Canada over-marketed this whole idea that, hey, we're all uh, igloos and stop it. 
you know, we, this is the northern extension of the Sonoran Desert. And so we get the same heat as Phoenix, but the days are longer. So do you think I can ripen red fruit? Heck yes. Um, it's, it's a mag, yeah, it's, it's absolutely magical in that response. And, and so what we're doing now is in my international journey, the, the, the most interesting part of this is my philosophy when I go internationally is don't sell poor. Let, I, I've been going to London now for 12 years and I know all the top reviewers and Stephen Spurrier became a very good friend of mine. He just passed away in January. It's just heartbreaking. But um, the, it, it, what we're starting to be recognized for are attributes that people didn't recognize were so unique to here. Like I went into a restaurant in Bordeaux called Le Chapon en Fence, the number one restaurant in Bordeaux. And I poured my reds to the wine director. There's a, there's a chef sommelier and then there are four other psalms that work for him. And I tasted four reds with him. And he looked at me and he, he said, these are extraordinary. I'm going to take them all. And I, I was so excited. And I said, well, there's a fifth. You haven't tried it yet. And he said, oh, what's that? And I said, it's my Cabernet Franc. And he said, oh, I've got to stop you there. He said, we have an agreement amongst all these psalms. We've, we've got, there, there are another four. So we buy together and we have an agreement that we will only buy Cabernet Franc from four regions in the world has to have bright acidity. So he named them off. It's Loire Valley and three others. And, and I said, would you just try it? And, and uh, he said, he said, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why not? So I, it was the only tasting I had that day. So I'd already opened the bottles. So I pour them like a half a glass because I want them to get the aromatics. And I've got one chance to close this guy on the Cabernet Franc. So he's living with it for the longest five minutes of my life. <laughs> and finally he takes a sip, puts his glass down. He said, we just found our fifth region. Wow. That was the most, that, awesome. was, that was absolutely one of the most one, one awesome. Sip. One sip. One sip. And then he stood up and he went out into the, into the restaurant, a very large restaurant, and he pointed to all the Psalms, came in, and they were doing a happy dance. And, and they're, they're really excited about it. And, uh, and I'm hearing, like, with my limited French, I'm trying to understand what they're saying, but I keep hearing this word, oh, can I get oh, can I get And I, I laughingly said, okay, if we're going to carry our wines, you have to say the word right. It's Okanagan. And they looked at me, and, the guy, and I, I, I challenged the guy, and he said, Okanagan. And I said, no, Okanagan. The next guy, he says, Okanagan. And I said, think Copenhagen with an O. And the guy looks at me and says, Okanagan. <laughs> and then the other guy says, Okanagan. <laughs> okay, okay, you're in it. Anyway, um, the journey's really fun now. And now I know a lot of these guys. I get orders from that same uh, restaurant. And they actually would, I, I got a call a few years later. And, and he came, he was speaking to me. And then he, he reiterated the word Okanagan properly, which is really cool. And uh, I get calls from friends of mine that go to this restaurant and others were at the Clove Club in London, the number one restaurant in London. Um, and I, I, I get calls from friends of mine that are in these restaurants that find our wines on the list. And they always take a picture and, you know, it's really satisfying because now it is about getting out there and rubber's hitting the road. You know, during COVID, you would have thought that, hey, it's going to be a really difficult time. Well, we've got a wonderfully loyal wine club and it's capped now at 3,700 or something, but um, we didn't have to lay off anybody, didn't take money from government, and, and we're really proud of that. Like good it's, for you. Because, yeah, we, that's because awesome. we had good support and good, well, you know, thank you, because people were at home, they were ordering, and they're supporting us and enabling. You know, if, I, there's, if there's one other thing in my world that is my primary concern that I need to, I find it as my personal challenge, is I have to solve interprovincial transfer wine. That, that issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have to solve that because we're the only nation on earth that does not allow the transfer of wine within its national borders. It's crazy. And so I took a, I wrote a letter to the editor in the Toronto Star in uh, November and I, I invited Premier Ford to be the free trade tr champion of Canada and, and allow Ontario residents because Christy Clark, they listened. And, and uh, um, Minister Coleman at the time, when, the, when Bill C-311 passed eight years ago, it allowed, the feds allowed for the interprovincial transfer of wine. And I was very involved with the provincial government. And I said, you have to allow British Columbian residents to point, click and buy wines from other provinces. And then Minister Coleman turned to me, I was on a radio program with him and he said, what if Ontario doesn't reciprocate? 
And I said, we'll shame them into it. Well, eight years later, they haven't reciprocated. And, and that's just the fair, you know, I'm sixth generation Canadian and my family are the Walkers from Walkerton. That's my third, William John Walker Skinner. Um, if I can't ship wine to my family in Ontario, my dad lost two brothers in the Second World War and an uncle in the first, like that's just crazy. It like is. We're, we should be Canadians first Shame on you. and support. Like it's 16% of the wines consumed by Canadians are Canadian wine. Every other wine producing on nation on earth, like France, it's 96%. Italy, it's, it's uh, 98%. Italians drink Italian wine. Canadian at 16 because they're not familiar, because we have these artificial prohibition restrictions that have not been taken down. And, and so if I ever get a <laughs> soapbox to stand on, which I'm standing on right now, it's let's get this solved. Let's talk to our politicians and let's, let's make it a good news. I'm going to vote for you, John. Yeah, I will too. Uh, so in Alberta, it, it, it's hard to find your wine. In yeah. fact, I don't know if it even exists anywhere. I've not found it. Uh, we we do we 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 sell. We've got an agent there, and we yeah. we're in we're in restaurants. Yeah, in restaurants. But for for us to go to a store, it's 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 hard. Yeah, and I think that that's the next step. Right. There's yeah. there is one that does it. The uh, Y and Z has their that's, wine. That's yeah, the but just a couple of them. Not just the, a couple. Right? Not the full ones. Right. John, I yeah. think uh, Hank's going to be walking out of here with about twelve cases of wine today. No, I don't think we have twelve <laughs> cases. Thanks, Wine Club. You've been so good. We're running out of wine. Oh, speaking of Wine Club, I was just put on your waiting list. I, I'm going to talk to you to get me on the list here. So I'm yeah, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So, so yeah. this has been fascinating. But when do we actually get to drink some wine? Let's let's try some wine. <laughs> yeah, we got some wine coming out. Um, Kate's going to bring out some now. The first wine that we'll try is our 2017 Merlot, and it's really interesting because what we've learned in in 20 uh, in 2013, Alain Sutra has been trying to teach. Like it's really interesting. In all these years, this guy's a perfectionist, and he'd been trying to teach me how to discern aromatics in a berry. And if you think about it, as you're walking through the vineyard, he'd look at me and he'd say, can you get these aromatics? And I, without putting a berry in your nose, I just, it just didn't work with me. It didn't register. I just couldn't get the aromatics. I'd taste it. i say, I can get the flavor. I can't get the aromatics. And uh, it was driving him crazy. So for a few years, he just, I just didn't get it. And then in 2013, we'd harvested about 70% of our Cabernet Franc block. And we were in there tasting fruit. And I turned to Alan and I said, do you get these aromatics? And he started to laugh and he, he said, if you didn't get it now, you'd never get it. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to excavate a trench beside this planting block. I want to see, because it's profoundly affected. He said, I want to see what's happened here. Because we planted in 05 and in 2013, it was a game changer. So excavate and like 10 or 12 feet down, the roots have reached down into the rocks. And that's what's profoundly changed. So now these are replicatable terroir notes that we get year after year. Uh, Stephen Spurrier and a group in London a few years ago did a vertical, or they, they did a um, just a, a blind tasting of about 30 Canadian reds. And after about a half an hour, he said, seven, 17 and 21. And everybody said, what are you referring to? And he said, painted rock, I can pick it out anywhere. And that's Steven Spurrier. That's like, I brilliant. just love the guy. He's such a, um, but, but the, the point is that early on in the journey, when we did our Merlot, our Merlot, we were allowed to blend in a little bit, like five or 8% or something. And we used to blend in a little bit of Malbec to soften the tannins. And, and it just was what's necessary as those roots are going down. I thought we're always going to do it. Then all of a sudden we hit the rocks and the flavor profile just opens remarkably. So now every single varietal that we do at Painted Rock is 100% that varietal. And we'll never, because as my advisors, like Stephen and Jancis Robinson and these people, they all are aware of our terroir. I'm trying to earn their trust. And, and you may get vintage variations. So you're going to try my 17 and then my 18. And those are vastly different wines. Same planting block, same everything, nothing. I don't buy fruit. I don't sell fruit. I don't commingle anything with anybody. We're on a singular journey that is not chest pounding, it's aspirational. And, and I, I welcome my neighbors and my friends and everybody 
and I'm very competitive and I like to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to compete against my neighbors. I want to compete against Washington state, against Napa, against all these guys, because I had one of the biggest buyers of wine in Napa Valley phone me just before COVID. And he said, um, his name's Peter Granoff and he's a really good guy. And he phoned me up and he said, okay, John, my name's Peter Granoff. Um, I said, Peter, I know who you are. I think I'd sent him like wine four or five times. I never got a return call from him. Anyway, um, he said, somebody gave me uh, a bottle of your wine last night. And I got two things to tell you. And I said, what's that? He said, it's absolutely exceptional and it's too cheap. He said, I own a whole bunch of wine stores in Los Angeles. And the Napa wines have just priced themselves out of our market. Like it's just, they are so expensive and yours is so reasonable. And I said, he said, so I'm going to place a substantial order. And I said, Peter, would you do me a favor? Hold off on the order and come and be my guest. I'm president of the Okanagan Wine Initiative. I want you to come and see our region and know our region. And in your stores, instead of have Painted Rock in the other section, have an Okanagan section. Come and meet. And I'll introduce you to, you know, Poplar Grove. They're fabulous people. And Haywire and 50th Parallel and Summerhill. And like, these are just rock stars. And I, I like them a lot. And, and those are the guys that we've just, and it was Martin's Lane and Checkmate. I'm not sure if they're, anyway, that's the team that we've been doing this international stuff with. We're trying to expand it, but it has to be very, they have to be on message and we all have to vouch for one another. And the word is not Painted Rock or Poplar Grove. The word is Okanagan. And that's, that's what we're doing. And I can't wait to get to Alberta and get in front of you guys. I can't wait to get to Ontario. And uh, I took an ad out on a radio about seven or eight years ago when all this uh, interprovincial trend, when this topic was very topical. And that year we'd won winery of the year, Intervin winery of the year. We've won it, we won it two out of five years in Canada, winery of the year. And I took a radio ad out in Toronto and I said, my name's John Skinner. I own British Columbia's Painted Rock Estate Winery. Make wine for all Canadians and I ship it to all Canadians. I ran that radio ad in Toronto for two weeks. Right on. I thought I was I was tempting Kathleen Wynn. I said, yeah. Kathleen, come on up, come after me. I'll see you in the yeah. Supreme Court. <laughs> no politician would, would would come after me. I guarantee you. I'll see her in Supreme Court, she'll lose an election. <laughs> anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway. So I was just interviewed by another by a uh, a media outlet this morning. And the lady called me from Toronto and she said, you know, um, we're, what are you doing about smoke there? And, and she said, we're hearing that down in Napa, there's now some kind of a sunscreen that they're spraying on fruit. And I said, what? I said, you know what? We've got sunscreen in the Okanagan. They're called leaves. Yeah. Leave your leaves on because it's not the smoke that affects the fruit. It's the soot. So if you leave your leaves on, we ripen fruit here, leaves or no leaves. So I don't worry about that, and I'm 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 more. So we'll leave the leaves on. We'll get the fruit ripe, and and hallelujah. But that business when she told me sunscreen on fruit, like we're organic too, and we're just working on certification. Um, we have we have never sprayed anything here, and that's Alan brought something to my attention right at the beginning because he saw the potential of this place, and he said, you know, this is what really excited him because. My mandate, my whole philosophy was he consults to some of the best wineries in the world. And I said, I want to compete with them. What they do, I want to do more. So if you consult to Petrus, I want to know what they do and I want to do more. And, and so when we had this dinner in London a couple of years ago, the theme of the dinner was Okanagan wineries that work with the Land Sutra. I had Stephen Spurrier sitting right there, Jancis Robinson here. Jancis wrote us up in the Financial Times. It was a really, she said, and she was blown away by a Land Sutra. She's looking at him saying, why haven't I heard of you? Wow. Like he's, he's just, um, like she turned after I had spoken and then Alan got up and he spoke and there were 14 people at this glorious dinner. And then everybody sat down, we're starting our dinner, and Jancis turned to Alan and said, Alan, what's the future of wine, of the wine industry? Like, what a question from the most powerful person in the world of wine. That's Jancis, most powerful person. And Alan looked at her and said, it's about sustainability and what you do and your responsibility. And her jaw dropped. Like, he's just so good. Like, that was just such a perfect answer. And he's so confident. Like, that's, so when we have that oversight here, I... Again, know what you don't know. <laughs> Bring in the experts. You know what? That's right. And delegate. But Alan doesn't tell us what to do. 
He shows us what to do and he teaches. So we've got a wonderful young winemaker who now has worked under Lance Sutra for 11 years. What a tutorial every second month. Wow. Like he is yeah. going to be, uh, he will be a fabulous resource for, for long after I'm gone and Alain's gone. We're the same age. <laughs> You're going to have Gabe Reese who is going to really know his stuff. And, and he marches to a different drum. Like he, he just is completely on message. It's not an ego thing with him, which I really am thankful for. He is a keen listener with a very good palate. I think uh, that might have something to do with your mentorship there. Well, that's very Fantastic. kind. Fantastic. You know, I, I really think that way because I think that our team is very engaged and are, are, we never, we have no overturn of staff here. Like my vineyard managers worked here since the beginning. Wow. Very Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. That's good. And that he's says completely a lot. engaged. Um, I try, we, we hire locally and the same people in the vineyard come back every year and they do things differently. They don't like when we're doing our, it was really interesting at the very beginning when we were doing uh, the first pruning and you lay the canes down. So everybody, I've got this crew, they've worked in the Okanagan now for many years, Ravinder Panu and his family, and I love these people. They're now retired, but they were fantastic for my first seven vintages. Um, they would get out there and they were laying down. What they would do is, is they'd worked at all these different wineries. And once you, you, you basically would, would lay the cane down for like two feet and then this side for two feet and then that side for two feet because it's, it's three feet between each plant and that's, that's basically what you do. Um, Alain said, no, 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 this is not what you do. Barry, as my vineyard manager, he said, this is in January and it was really cold. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to, to rate every plant in the vineyard and, and it's based on this, the thickness of the trunk. There's a one, a two, and a three. I can see three different grades. So a one is only going to carry five buds on each side. A two is going to carry eight, and a three is going to carry 12. Okay? And I want you to rate and, and write it down. Every row, every plant, he had a map of this stuff. And every one of the guys out there had to carry this book. Oh, that's it. So... And then they did it. Well, over the next few years, the plants are carrying exactly the right amount of fruit and working exactly as hard as they should, given their size. Well, now take a look out there and everything is perfectly balanced because they've been working the, the, the right amount. And no one had ever heard of that before. Like it was just, this is... Just some local guys guy. that do it this way and that's what it was. Totally. And, and then it came down. Then the next thing was harvest. I go out at harvest with Alain and, and we look and these guys at the other wineries used to get bonused on tonnage. They'd put everything in the bin because you know they weigh it at the end of the day and they get paid based on that. Whereas here we got a different mandate. We are, um, if the cluster isn't perfect, it goes on the ground. And so you'd have, you'd see a cluster have a wasp nest in it sometimes and just stuff that goes on the ground. And if it's not perfect, it goes on the ground. And I'd watch them and every once in a while I'd come and I'd see somebody put a bad one in there because I want to do all the sorting in the vineyard. I got a sorting line. It's Latrier. It vibrates. It's as good as it gets, but I don't want to do it. I want everybody to stand at the sorting table line with their hands behind their backs because all the fruit's perfect. So it got a little difficult because I'd come and I'd see them putting, you know, it's just back to their old habits. Throw everything in there. Throw everything in there. So Alan said, if you keep doing this, we're going to let you go. And then I'd come and I had to watch them because the land's going back to France. And I'd say, you know, well, for the years after that, I'd walk in and Ravinder would be there and he'd get a, he'd get a, find a, a bad cluster. He'd throw it. He'd say, Hey John, throw it over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did. Make and a his wish. staff all knew that and his family knew that. And it was just, we had such a good, and then he phoned me one day after seven years and he said, John, I have to retire. And I said, I, I, I said, Ravinder, I get it. Like he's 75 at the time. He's working really hard. And, and I said, Ravinder, what about your children? Can your children maybe take, take your spot? I'll, I'll, it'll be a really good career for them. And he said, ah, John, I'm sorry. Look, one's going to law school and two are going to med school. <laughs> These are good new Canadians. I just love what they did for their family. And they worked hard. They worked super hard to an older age. And, uh, you know, there's one story in 2010, we had... 15 bears in here. We call it the barely there vintage. I'm totally serious. We lost 11 tons of fruit to bears. 
We couldn't get rid of them. I phoned the um, conservation officer in town and I said, you know, we're in the city of Penticton, you've got to send one of those big bins up here and let's get rid of some bears. And the guy laughed at me and he said, they're calling your vineyard the, the, the dinner table. No other vineyard in town has an issue with bears except you. Well, what we'd done is we dropped an appropriate amount of fruit because it was a cold season. And we were going to get ripe fruit and it's a cost of doing it. And nature told us that we were doing the right thing because the bears all came here. They right can smell yeah. ripe fruit. Nobody had ripe fruit like that. And it was just, I said, okay, they'll get me this year, but they're not getting me next year. So when you drove, when you drove in here, you drove across a pad, that's electric. Yeah. So when the fruit is ripe, we flick a switch and this place is like Fort Knox. <laughs> Nothing gets in here. The next year, I, was, I, was, I got a phone call if I was down in the city. I got a phone call from Barry Green, my, our, our vineyard manager. And he said, John, you won't believe what I see at the, front, at the front gate. And I said, what's that? He said, it's that mama bear from last year. Because there was a mama and two cubs in here and she was aggressive. He said, that's that mama. She's sitting outside the gate just, sh just shaking her head. <laughs> she must have stepped on that pad so many times. <laughs> she couldn't get in here. And then, and then finally, we pointed to Pentage, my buddy Paul, and I said, I said, go over to Pentage. He doesn't have any electricity over there. <laughs> Melody, Melody, you had a question? Yeah. Yes. Hi, John. Um, we hear a lot of um, you know, talk about organic. So what makes a certified organic winery? It's all about uh, primarily, it's what you don't put in the soil. And when Alain first saw this place, he was adamant. He said, he said you know, we don't have, we don't get rot and mildew and anything like that. This site is always windy. It's like we have a helicopter over it. So we don't have those issues. But the other thing is, if you go up and down the Okanagan Valley and you see these vineyards that look like there's a runway underneath the plant, well, those guys spray Roundup at night when nobody's looking. And that's just, that's unfortunate. You know, stop it. What we did at the very beginning, Alan said, I don't want you to do this. I want you to go out and buy a machine called a grape hoe. And it's got fingers and it's got a sensor. It's a very fabulous piece of machinery. It's difficult to operate. It exhausts Barry to do it. You have to watch really closely, but it senses where the trunk is and it fingers go down and it brings the roots of the weeds up and we get rid of them naturally. So there's no spraying of anything. So after like year two, Barry and it was me, Barry and Alan, and we're there, and, and Alan is saying, "So how are you like using it?" And he says, "Oh, it's brain damage to drive that thing. It's just you have to focus so so hard on it." And he said, "He said, you know, I'd much prefer it if we could just kind of do what these other guys do and spray when nobody's looking." And uh, uh, Alan, Alan looked at Barry and he said, "Barry, this is a vineyard, not a golf course." <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. Like that's 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 the way. Like you got to think. This is, this is very important. That stuff doesn't become inert and you're putting it into your soil. And I, when I started Painted Rock, I started with a very clear vision that it was a legacy family business. So I'm a steward of this. It makes the decisions you make. You can never make a compromise. I've got the, my third, I've got two, a two and a half year old granddaughter, a two year old granddaughter. My daughter, Trit, or Lauren is going to give birth in September to our third granddaughter, uh, Stella. I talk to her belly all the time. Hey, Stella. I'm just, they, so I've been in the industry a third of my life. I'm 60, turning 63. My daughter's been in a half of her life. My grandkids been in a hundred percent of theirs and it's, this is going to be theirs. So if you have that commitment, then the idea of making a compromise, like there are things you can do. And I've been offered every compromise in the planet that you could do. So I had one of the other wineries tell me right at the beginning, they saw that I bought a hundred percent new French oak in my first vintage. And there's a couple of reasons for that. New French oak would do two things. One, with your first planting, there's a youthful expression of fruit that can handle new oak. But also, Alain came, and he was the guy who picked the oak. And he said, I'm going to rate this Cooper, Seg MRO, against each clone of each variety. And it's out of five. So one would be 3.75, one would be 4.25, all this kind of stuff. Then in year two, I want you to buy 100% new French oak and it's going to be 50% Sega Moreau and 50% Sorry. And then in year three, 100% new again, it's going to be Sega Moreau, Sorry, and Bel Air. You will have done 25 years Cooper due diligence in three years. Cost me three quarters of a million bucks to do that. And I said, do it. And uh, in year two, when I was sending out my first vint year of the oak, I sold it all to Poplar Grove. I paid 1350 bucks a barrel. I sold it for 350 bucks to them. And I've had new stuff coming in. And there's another winery owner standing down at my winery down there. He said, John, what are you doing? And I said, I said, this is what we're doing. And he said, oh man, 
I could have saved you a quarter million bucks. And I said, what do you mean? He said, all you do is you put a stave in the one-year-old barrel and it reinvigorates the oak. And I said, no, I trust Alain. I'm just going to stick with what he wants me to do and, and we're going to go ahead and do it. Well, uh, fast forward when we have our 20, 2008 vintage in barrel and I get a call from one of the most powerful wine reviewers in the world, um, Gerard Bertrand from London. It was, this is one of Janice Robinson's best friends. And he's, he's an uh, Order of the British Empire, like a really serious wine reviewer. And he calls me, and it's like 10 o'clock at night. He said, John, my name is Gerard. I didn't even know who he was. <laughs> and, and, and he said, I'm in the Okanagan Valley for three days. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, but I've heard a lot about Painted Rock. Can I come by tomorrow at 10 a.m. just to have a quick visit? And I said, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm here. So he comes. I Googled him in the meantime, and I realized, holy mackerel. I got one of the most powerful guys in the world coming tomorrow. So he comes and he walks in and we're tasting my, my 07 vintage, the first one. And then we go to my 08 and it's in barrel. And he says, I can't believe this is your second vintage. And thank God you don't do what that guy up the road does. I said, what's that? He says, he puts staves in the barrels and doesn't think we can tell. And I said, did he tell you that? And he said, no, only one of the four sides is toasted. The other side, three Three sides is not toasted, and it imparts something that is so identifiably and so offensive that it's insulting when they do this. So when I put on, when I was involved in uh, that London event at Canada House a couple of years later, um, one of the first guys in the room was Gerard, and he walked in. There's 34 Canadian wineries. He walks in, he points at me across the room, and he says, "There's my favorite winery owner, the guy who cuts no corners." <laughs> Hey, you know what? Great you story. Go. Oh, I just love, yeah. I'm so proud of that. And it just gets, it, it's pretty simple when you just have a, a strict mandate like that. Yeah. It makes your life easier, honestly. Yeah. If I was trying to cut corners and figure out ways, there's always, I'd have to think about it. And now I just don't. I just say, don't do that. Just don't do it. And, and all these things, any of these expensive decisions that I plan on, but you know the primary, most important thing about buying that new French oak every year? For the first three, if we ever used second fill and third fill, which we do now, we buy 40% new every year, but then we use second and third fill from stuff that we had. If you ever bring anyone else's oak into your winery, you're bringing their hygiene in. And if you have a hygiene flaw like Brettamyces or something, it's shared, you'll never get rid of it. So Lan said, I've never worked with a winery from scratch, so I can keep you totally hygienically free if you never do this. So we have a rule. Anybody brings within a country mile somebody else's oak into my place. Never gonna happen. And and that was that was a fabulous lesson because it may have cost me three quarters of a million bucks for that oak at the beginning, but what have I saved in clean hygiene? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If we had something that all of a sudden it, it it did something to hurt a vintage, like it's way more affecting. And now I just have peace of mind. So let me ask a question on that yeah. then. A business question. So being that perfectionist to say it's got to be perfect every yeah. time means there's a lot of cop capital you got to spend where others might take corners to maybe get a profitability faster. So in your experience as a winemaker, did it take you longer your profitability or did it, did it happen about the same time because people just faster. Faster. Went faster because we ended up winning stuff and we got you know in my very first vintage we charged 55 dollars a bottle for our red icon blend because i knew the lengths to which we were going and it was all this new oak and all this stuff and i just said you know what i know and i want to honor the fact that of our brand and and i had feedback from people and say that's pretty aggressive that price point you're doing and stuff and i had uh one guy a master of wine wrote an article he was as I was in the investment business in Vancouver and building the winery, this guy was coming in. He's quite a well-known guy. And he's coming to my office and sitting on my coach all the time. And he wanted me to hire him. And I just had nothing for him to do. And he was there constantly. And he hadn't got his master of wine yet. But uh, there was some bitterness that I never hired him. And then the day that we released our first wine, he published an article and said, I don't even need to taste Painted Rock's red icon to know that it's too young and overpriced and he put that and and i felt like writing a letter to to the people who give the master of wine accreditation and say you're this guy's so good he doesn't even have to taste my wine i didn't do that i bit my tongue it's not my style but i didn't do anything but um it, it's just been the journey for me now is from a price point 
like that's $55 and that was in 08 and it's now 2021 and it's 60, $65. So I haven't been in a hurry because you know why? I've got you guys and we have our efficiencies are better than anybody's in the business. And because we have an incredibly loyal group of people, it enables me to keep my prices down and sh I don't have agents. We've got, I've got an agent in, in Alberta, small bits, but it's my daughter, Lauren, and it's my team. And so we pass that on to our community. And I've always said a price point has to be earned, not assumed. And there are too many wineries in this, in our valley right now, charged 110, 120 bucks mm -hmm. for things. I don't think that's been earned. And that's just my opinion. They can do what they want. But profitability, I think we're probably the most profitable winery in the business. I, I would agree with you that the prices, at least in Alberta, I don't know if it's everywhere else, but they get to beyond the average person and they'll never, never ever pay for it. And then they don't know what they're drinking. You know, when we win decant, a decanter wine of the year award, when we, if we get written up nicely by, um, I'm getting calls now from really serious distributors. There's a major distributor out of uh, out of Napa, and they want they they really like Painted Rock. They carry 40 brands from around the world, nothing from Canada, and they want Painted Rock to be their first. And I'm honored. And I I if we are, you know, I will always I I just want all of our wine club and the people the consumers that purchase Painted Rock to know we do our level best to keep our prices down. Um, everything else is going up in price. I just found out that we're shipping all of our barrels over and the shipping price just tripled. You know, that's, that's it. These, you know, these, it is what it is. John, if I could just uh, say something, uh, when I'm going out for dinner to uh, very special people or clients, I'm taking my iconic red bottle of painted rock with me. Oh, I really like and that. Uh, I, I just put it on the table and uh, I don't say anything open it up and then they start commenting and they start telling me what a, what a fantastic bottle of, of, of wine you're bringing. I really appreciate that. And for me, you know what it is? It's, it's not that we've had a good vintage. It's, it's that every vintage, I keep thinking it's getting better every year. Like 2017 won that decanter thing, 18 is better. So that's something we celebrate here, vintage variation. You get a, you're going to get a, a, a vintage that was hotter in 17 and cooler in 18. Right. And so brighter acidity in 18. That's just what you're going to get. And hallelujah, right. celebrate it. And that's, that's like, I'm a, I, I've been a long time uh, wine collector and I collect by vintage. I don't see, uh, it was really amazing. Alan told me at the very beginning of this journey, he said, you never have to have a bad vintage here because you've got so many things on your site that you can do to ensure that you get ripe, good ripe fruit. So it's the crop load that you carry, it's leaves on, leaves off, all these different things that he said, this, this is so unique that, you know, we don't have issues with frost here. Why? This air movement. Like it's crazy. Everybody else does. It was, it was pretty warm when we started this podcast, but I can feel the air going by us now. Yeah. It's starting to feel pretty nice. It it does, and it, it's it's honestly it's just wait. If we were sitting here at quarter to nine tonight, when the sun goes down, there's a cool breeze that sweeps right through the vineyard. Yeah, and it takes the heat off, and that creates nice microclimate. And it's predictable. I I do these winemaker dinners, and I'll say to everybody, everybody put your sweaters on, and they'll be sitting there. Totally serious, because it goes from from you know uh, thirty two degrees to twenty two degrees right. in short order, and. You know what? That's what makes us. Napa can't do it. So when I want to compete against these guys, it's I want to go head to head. We are not trying to be Napa. We're not trying to be Bordeaux. Remember I told you we got those Bordeaux varietals? When, when I was walking the vineyard with Alain Sutra at the very beginning, uh, Alain looked at me and he said, so you've got these two clones of every variety. What is it that you want to do? And I said, well, you know what? If you work with me, you're going to have to throw that rule book out. I'm not trying to make a Bordeaux blend. I'm making, a, I'm making an Okanagan blend. Throw the rule book out. I don't want it to be similar to what it is. And he said, if you said anything different, John, I wouldn't work for you. That was, so I just knew that he and I are on the same page. Like we are so much in lockstep. It's, it's fabulous. So, so, so John. A Bordeaux blend. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. What? What? Uh, what are you doing? You're, what are you doing? Who's talking, talking first? What's I'm going talking. on? I got here first. All right. Bordeaux itself from France, they, you can't call, anybody else cannot call their wine a Bordeaux, is that, yeah. that's true. Yeah. So it's always a blend. Yeah. Uh, and if I get this right, Melbec, Merlot, and Cap Franc. Petit Verdot, hmm? Cab Sau, Cap, Cap, Cap Franc. Okay. No, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's almost all five, but every once in a while, 
and this is a good one. So in 2009, we've like seven won the Lieutenant Governor's Award. Like this is, we're really on a, I'm really digging what Alain does because we do the blending together. And, and in 2009, we've got, the, the icon is put together. We're sitting in my office down, down in the winery. And I'm looking at Alain saying, this is fabulous. And he said, I've got an idea. I said, I swore. I said, don't F with it. It's perfect. And, and he said, look, just why don't you, and there was another guy there with me. He said, why don't you guys just leave and come back in five minutes? Okay. So we did. And there were two glasses out for each of us. And so I pick up the first one on the left. I said, that's it. It's perfect. I totally remember it. It's just so good. And then I pick up the second. Oh, what did you do? Like, it's crazy. And he starts to laugh and he says, 1% Syrah. 1%. It was a chemical reaction rather than one part of a hunt. Like, it was amazing what it did. And I turned to him and I said, well, we're not a Bordeaux blend anymore. And he looks at me and says, you have no idea what they do in Bordeaux. <laughs> I said, what do they do? Drive around with a, with a bucket of Syrah in the trunk? Yeah. And <laughs> pour, but it, 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 it had, we only did it, we've done it twice in, wow. in all of our history, just a little bit. But I actually put that 1% on the label. And then a few years later, um, Alain is very, obviously it's a really competitive community and he's very proud of what he's doing here. So he called me one day and he said, John, would you send me a few bottles of that? We're going to be doing this, this tasting in Bordeaux with all these top winemakers. And so I sent them over to him. And then about a month or two later, I get a phone call from him. And in, like it, it's kind of like now, which would be, what time in, in Bordeaux? Like really late. And, and he says, John, is a land. And I said, yes. He said, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you put, you put this, that there's 1% Syrah on the label. And he said, that's a state secret. <laughs> oh, my God. I just love the guy. You know what? I had nothing to, we, it's an Okanagan blend. And we just happened to have done it that way. And it was, we won't, and then we did it 2% in another vintage. I can't remember which, but it's just, if you taste a vertical, like a vertical of these wines, very similar, but getting better every year. Because now it's not, the journey is not, can we produce the big reds? We know we can. It's the pursuit of elegance. It's all about elegance now. Because I know, you know, in, in, in Napa Valley, they produce these big, ripe monsters. It's not what we're after. I, I, you know, we, we produce nice, ripe fruit. But I want to produce something that along the lines of a Cheval Blanc. I want to produce something that somebody is just so. I was invited to a, to a to a wine dinner at 67 Palm Mall with Stephen Spurrier and Jancis and all these like it was really really fabulous people. And the theme of the dinner, Jancis wasn't at this one, but it was top wine reviewers. And the theme of the dinner, Stephen suggested it. He said, "I want you to bring the wine you're most proud of, and I want you to bring your inspiration." And two of my other friends were there, like Tony Holler with Poplar Grove and. I think it was um, Sarah Triggs with Comina. And so I immediately pick up my phone, I phone Alain, I said, what are we most proud of and what's our inspiration? You know, I, I couldn't, couldn't say it. So, so he said, well, you know, when I did my first tasting at Painted Rock in the barrel room of our first vintage, he said, my mind didn't go to a region, it went to one winery in the world. I said, come on. And he said, yeah. It's the right bank of Bordeaux. It's the most elevated vineyard in the right bank with the brightest acidity. It's Cheval Blanc. So I said, okay. Um, so I phoned my daughter, Lauren, and I said, can you go find me a couple bottles of Cheval Blanc? Well, the 2000 vintage, 2005 vintage was spectacular, and that's the one she found. She gets two bottles of this, 3,000 bucks a bottle, and I brought them to London. And the last two wines at this dinner that night side by side, because all the other wineries had been earlier, and the last two wines of the night were the 05 Cheval Blanc beside our 09 Red Icon. And everybody around the table is going like this. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. No, it was, it was really... Uh, so I... No, there's a gentleman named Ronan. He's master of wine across the table. He said to Stephen Spurrier, sitting to my right, he said, Stephen, what are you going to say? <laughs> Stephen said... I can't say anything. John will quote me. <laughs> he's just, he's just the best. And I said, you're darn right. Of it. So, so about 20 minutes later, Stephen stood up 
And he said, I've got a quote for John. And I said, whoa, okay. Stood up and he said, John, your painted rock red icon is more CB than BC. That's Stephen. Whoa. You know what? From Stephen, the, one of the most respected guys in the world of wine. Um, it was a real honor. And those, those are the little things that when that kind of thing happens, it just solidified, uh, like, man, I, I just was so impressed with where we're going and it gets back to going to make a compromise. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like I just, I'm just always, you ask me, do I look at other wineries? I look at other, other wineries on the world stage and try to figure out if there's anything they're doing. But interestingly enough, when, when, uh, when Alain was speaking in London with Jancis and, and Stephen and everybody there, he said, I don't think there's another vineyard on the planet that knows its terroir better than Payne's Rock. So you're going to taste it in the wine. All these things, happy employees, you're going to taste it in the wine. Happy vineyard, you taste it in the wine. And that's just... Happy so, customer. So, Cheers. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. So, so basically that's what you're nice. telling us, John, is that Alon kind of runs this whole place and you're kind of like the tourist. I just do it as so I'm told. He said, I'm the only customer he's ever had that does 100% of what he asks. <laughs> he, 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 said, he said, you know, with Petrus, they do maybe 5%, but they've been in the industry hundreds of years. So he's, these, they, they are, whereas I don't come to it. I don't pretend to have come to the industry with a background. So I'm, I'm an enthusiast and I completely respect, but my daughter, Lauren, WSET level three, MBA in Bordeaux. Watch what these grandkids do. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I have huge confidence that if they, if they want to do it, this is going to be theirs. And, and I hope maybe they can raise prices by then. <laughs> I have to I have to say, John. Um, so I'm not a wine expert by any means. This is Melody, um, but everyone makes fun of me because they call me the wine snob because I'm very very particular about my red wines. And coming here to the Okanagan, um, I'd always say, oh yeah, their their whites are really really spectacular, but their reds not so much. Um, I can say by having these three tastings, absolutely awesome. I, I seriously think this is the best wine I've had here in the Okanagan. So. Um, kudos to you. Like, I mean, honestly, it's a beautiful red wine and, and we're going to be buying them. So, I mean, no, amazing. I really appreciate it. So I re that's, that's very kind. So touche, that's awesome. I, I don't want to say anything, but by the way, is she drinking your wine before? Cause I brought it to her house. <laughs> and I said, no, you gotta try this bloody wine. Oh, that's nice. But you know, it, it's, it's fun to share the journey and that's what I like most. You know, we've, uh, um, there's so many people that are engaged in it that I, I, you know, we may have 3,700 or whatever number of people in our wine club. I probably know half of them, three quarters of them. Like it really is, it becomes, a, um, I, I just love the journey and, you know, being able to, I can't go back and taste all my old, older wines, but I'm getting updates all the time. Yeah. Opened the nine last yeah, night yeah. <laughs> and I haven't in a while. And I want to know how long is the finish? Is there still fruit? Because that, when, when if, you, if you put it in the drink now ca category, the finish becomes more abbreviated and the fruit disappears. And if that's starting to happen, well, it's none of ours. They're yeah. all. And that's the thing. When you, go to, when you go to Europe, you have to, we're a new wine region. So to get their confidence, I have to be going for like 10 years so that they've had this experience. And, and I bring old stuff. And I say, okay, remember... Like this stuff, when, when this valley was always cropping to seven tons an acre and the wines wouldn't last five years, say, okay, I got something to show you. And this is, we are adhering to more, more aggressive practices and we want to earn their trust. So, so I, have, I have a question about your wine, besides the fact that I drink it. Yep. Um, he drinks it a lot, by the way. I drink it a lot. It's good. Um, when you open your icon, um, how long do you want to leave it? to breathe really good depending on the vintage um i think a minimum of a two hour decant on the two hours eh? uh, oh yeah that's it's it's gonna take it to a different place um i would strongly suggest to anybody there's a product called a v-spin and that's i found it at le chef enfin in bordeaux when i was at that restaurant it was really cool because here i'm i i'm sitting in this office doing a tasting and they've got this machine, and it's like a piece of lab equipment, and it just gently stirs, and it opens up the, the it's in a decanter with this piece of um, stuff going around, and, and it opens up. So two minutes in that is like a two-hour decant. Five minutes is like a, so it's really good. I strongly suggest that. But when, when I, I watched what they were do, doing, 
if I see it in the finest restaurant in Bordeaux, it's okay for here. And that, so, so that's, that's something that really, really impressed well, me. And what was it called again? It's called a V-spin. V-spin. Yeah. We sell them. Yeah. I'm oh. trying to oh, there we go. There's no. a commercial. <laughs> Good commercial. See? Go buy a B-spin. I think spoke. you just sold six. They, they are, no, they are just, I, I mean, honestly, why wouldn't you spend a little bit of money to turn your $50, $65 bottle into a $165 bottle. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it just, it just is, it just makes so much sense. Okay. Well, we're, we're ending the, the, the part of our podcast now yeah. that uh, we have some flash questions. Oh, All cool. Right? Okay. Fire away. Who's going to go first? What do you prefer? Red or white wine? I've had some Montrachets that are pretty killer, but I think red. What's your favorite wine you've ever drank? My favorite wine I ever drank. That's really good. Um, I had the privilege of drinking uh, a 1945 Mouton Rothschild. Oh my and god! And that is that is an oh my god! I only just it, it was a whole bunch of us. It was syndicated amongst all of us. It was the my my friend's dad had a phenomenal cellar. You know, I think the favorite wine I've ever had, uh, the one that really turned me on to wine, was a 1985 Heights Martha's Vineyard. I bought two cases from Ray Signorello. He had a bunch of them, and that was a hundred point wine, and that just turned me on to it. Wow. I just said, yeah. "That is a superb wine." And you're just a young look back then, just a young. Yeah, box. yeah, I was a kid, and, yeah. and you know what? It's it's, and unfortunately, I drank it all. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't save it. What what, what is the what is the worst wine you've had in this valley? The worst wine. The worst oh, yes. wine. The one you said, "Oh my God, they don't deserve to be here." Okay, I. No, this was it, it, it's it, this guy completely deserves to be here, but he he's he takes risks, and I bought I, I took all my staff to this winery it goes unnamed, and I I bought a case for everybody let them pick out and and I just thought we're supporting our community and that's it's really important and it's not far from here, and uh, we everybody went home with a case of wine, and that night I opened up one. And I poured it and I went, whoa, that's got like a, something kind of weird going on. Maybe I'll just leave that and try it again tomorrow. Well, I tried it the next day and I poured it into my glass and it came out like goop. Blub, blub, blub. So I sent him a note and I said, you know, I got to show you this because you got to. And, and uh, I noticed like the next day there was a, a credit on my credit card for everything I'd bought. And I just said, no, this is not how, this is, you, you, you can pay me back for that bottle, but I'm keeping all the rest. And all the rest of the bottles were great. Oh, so it's just a bad, just a bad one. No, it wasn't a bad bottle. It, he'd taken a risk on, on, you know, some guys are doing natural and they're doing stuff. And, and this one, you can make some mistakes. And this one was a mistake and he owned it like way too much. So I, it was, but as an industry, for me to have the guts to go to him and for him to, to make the effort to reimburse me in entirety, which is, I didn't accept. I said, you, All right. you charge that. Moving on, moving yeah. on. Uh, I, I, I've got a flash question for you. I'm a retired architect, so I would like to know who your favorite architect is. Dominic Unsworth, he did this. Fantastic piece of architecture here. Everyone's got to come see this. This I is just brilliant. Love it. But you know what? I knew Arthur Erickson well. And he wanted to design the winery, he, the tasting room. He wanted to do it, and he passed away not that long after it. But he was a gem of a guy. Our lunches were four hours. It was just fun as could be, but such a character. That was. That was I, a I did a few project. projects with Arthur Erickson, which included the Twisted Tower on Georgia Street oh, in downtown right? Vancouver. He's, he's 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 a he was a gem. A of gem a guy. for sure. Have you ever snuck in uh, to your own winery, uh, brand new keg? No one else has tasted it. You snuck in, looking around. If you ever pull yourself a glass, close it, and you can say, okay, I'm going to try this, even though the winemaker's not around. Well, you know, I do it all the time because you have to know your wines and you have to see the evolution. And what I like doing with wine club members is there's a window between the beginning of July and the end of July when we bottle, we're bottling right now. So uh, when there's no COVID, I always incur encourage wine club members come here and do a tank tasting with me of all the wines that we've put together from barrel alan has come he was here last week to do the last tweak on the icon that's why he came here and so the final wine you're going to get 
a sneak preview of everything instead of opening your wine club just you know out of curiosity people open a bottle don't do that come here taste it know what it's going to be like six months after it's been bottled because it's going to be shocked at the beginning once it's been bottled come and taste it it's fabulous out of the tank and then you'll know better what the small lots come and taste the syrah cab the the syrah from 2019 is Fabulous. Sounds like a road oh, trip for the old wise guys. I, I, I think, another road trip. I think we're going to do that. I know that when you're doing a wine tasting, people just spit it out, the ones that are doing it, because they're doing it all day long. Yeah. In this particular case, full out, swallow it down. And we're doing the whole thing, or you spit it out? When I'm doing those tastings? No, no I didn't. Really the one you snuck the. Uh... Oh, no, I'll just spit it out. You know, if I if I didn't, I'm I'm around this all the time. <laughs> you, gotta, yeah. you really got to pick then, your spots. Then you'd be like the old wise guys. Yeah. 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 No, I don't know. I don't know. And you're not around it all the time. You, you you just get used to it. It becomes it's in a different place. Wine spritzers, sacrilegious or a decent drink? If somebody likes them, I'm. You know what? I'm a I'm an equal opportunity guy. Just just because some some people really like it. Some people like putting an ice cube in their white wine. It's okay. Don't do it. Don't do it to mine. I once, I once got home years ago, and one of the finest wines I ever had was a 1989 Marquis de la Guiche Montrachet. Really, really good. Very expensive. And I had six bottles in my cellar, and my cellar was very large, but I had very little re white wine. I just had reds to cellar for a long time. And then one day I came home, and, and I look in our, uh, across our, our family room. We had a swimming pool in West Vancouver. And I see my wife's girlfriends all out there. And my wife's not there. And I went out and I, I said, hey, Joan, where's Trish? She said, oh, she went to the liquor store to get us some white wine. And I look on the table and there's a bottle of my Marquis de la Guiche. She'd gone down in there. And, and she, said, she said, oh, yeah, you didn't have my, very much white, but I found this one. That was, <laughs> it was like 500 bucks a bottle. And I'd had it in my cellar for years. Like it was an 89. It was the, one of the best... And they were making spritzers out of it. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. Joan hasn't been back to our house. My favorite dinner is lamb. And I'm wondering, what's the best painted rock wine to pair with lamb? Oh, that's nice. I would, um, that's, that's really good. You know, typically I would say Syrah is really good with um, steaks and spicy food. Merlot, I would say, is going to be really, really good with it. An older Merlot just has that soft, broad mouthfeel. I think it'd be a really good pairing with it. I'm going to throw another spin on you. What's your favorite uh, band? Oh, God. You know what? It's really funny. I got to a friend of mine, very wealthy guy, puts on a summer party every year, and he hasn't since COVID, but it's a philanthropic thing. So he has people like Rod Stewart there, and he has Rod, and, and I got, to, one of them, Roger Hodgson was there from Supertramp. Yeah. And I got, I had lunch with Roger. And he, wow. played, he played for us the whole afternoon. And he's a Give gem a of a guy. Give a little bit. And, da, da, da. Oh, yeah. It was, he, he's such a gem of a guy. But what a, a unique opportunity to, to, to get, you know, I met Billy Idol there. I met, like, he's, he has these crazy people. Man. And, but it's, it's done for a good thing. He's raising money. And, and, and he's, he's, he's doing good things. And he's a, he's a very passionate philanthropist. And he makes us write checks, too. <laughs> he's good at it. Uh, I want to know, do you ever find time to golf? With the, yes, know, I used to be a pretty good golfer. I'm just taking it up again. I think we've got this one. That What's your favorite holiday location when you're not at this winery? You know what I've done? Well, south of France. I mean, we've, I, I, I just love I'd it. Love I love it there. I, I just love, love it. it. We've, we've, we've spent seven summers there. And, wow. uh, um So we used to rent a house in a village called Pelisson outside of Salon de Provence. Oh, yeah. And it's just gorgeous and we'd go um and the other places you know what we did i rented the uh, frescobaldi estate one summer for two weeks with another family the house was so big we could have 15 families there it was unbelievable it was in outside of grosseto and we spent a few weeks there it was incredible wow fantastic last question last question on yeah. the spin questions have you bought your jeff bezos ticket to space yet <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm not, I don't like heights. <laughs> I don't need that one. Good answer. Good My dad answer. was a fighter pilot. He's, he, he, he really wanted me to be a fighter pilot. So, I, so I, timed that, I timed that perfectly because your iconic red's coming out right now. So 
this is kind of the end, the getting near the end of our podcast. And I was awesome. waiting for this wine to come out because this is by far my favorite wine in the world. You decant it properly and it's it's better than I've tasted in the $150 bottles of wine, $200 bottles of wine. Right. So I hope you enjoy this one. Right? One, one thing I'd like to say is I've known I had El Jefe for 40 years, basically. And yeah. about that time is when I met my wife and she only drank white wine. And I gave her some very expensive, back in 1983, I think I was paying $30 a bottle. For this I think it was thing. called Baby Duck, right? Uh, no, no, it was a French Primard. One thing you don't want to do is give your white wine uh, loving wife a really quality red wine. Otherwise, it converts them over to red wine and, <laughs> and makes you broke. This this uh, uh, red icon would convert any white wine drinker over to a delicious red wine. And I Very thank you for this. Thank you. Question. Tell us about it. So one thing I will mention, um, you know why it's red icon? Not because it's an iconic red. We are painted rock because we have 500-year-old pictographs on the back of our property. They're pictures of icons in red. Some young man painted wow. these. So that's the red icon. That's why we're painted rock. And 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 it, it, it has, to me, at the time when we were naming this, um, it was all about cute, dirty laundry and laughing stock and all this stuff. And I said, that's not me. If you want to build a generational family business, I don't want six generations of Skinners to look back and say, why the hell did he name it Harry Armpit? Like, that's just really <laughs> pisses me off. So I didn't want to do it. It's painted rock because it's all about here. My dad was an amateur archaeologist. I spent my youth doing an art. We lived in Comox on the water. The Our home was host of a midden in 100 years old. And that's where the First Nations used to have their festivals. So my dad did an archaeological dig on this property that was like an acre and a half right in the center of Comox on the water. And I did all the shoveling. He had a screen. I did all the shoveling. I'm like 10, 11, 12 years old. And my dad took all the credit. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, he died at 55. He's long since been deceased. But this is an homage to him. And I said, so we are painted rock because we have 400-year-old pictographs on the back of our property. And there's a heckler in the crowd. And he said, they're 500 years old. And I look out, and it's the chief of the band. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 514 year old pictographs in the back of our <laughs> anyway melody you have i do um john can you hear me <laughs> i'm hoping that you can give me one of your really interesting facts about your rosé but let me tell you why first yeah to help me be more of a hero with my daughter-in-law that i am already a painted rock rosé hero and let me tell you what happened about i'm not quite sure on the um, on the wine club when the painted rock goes on sale, but it was a few months ago. It was within the last... In March. In March, okay. So about a month and a half before March, Andrea, she called me and she said, I'm working, I need rosé, and I need you to get it for me. I said, well, like, what I have to, I have to drive to Penticton? What do I have to do? She says, no, you just have to go online and you have to order it, but you've got to go online at 10 a.m. And you've got to be online at 10 a.m. I'm like, oh, my God. So I set my alarm, everything. I've got two computers and my little, my phone's here. And every time somebody texts me, talk later, talk later, talk later. And I've got both computers <laughs> going and I've got to it. get this wine. So anyway, I get the wine. I order it. It's going to be delivered to the house. And about 2.30 that afternoon, she gets off work and she calls me and she says, so I guess you didn't get me any wine. And I said, why do you think that? And she says, well, it's sold out by 10.06. So I quickly sent her a copy of the invoice and sent it to her. And she's like, yeah, I'm your best mother-in-law ever. It was so stressful for my team and my daughter, Lauren. Lauren, because, you know, she's really engaged with our community. And, and she, so she would get personal emails from a lot of people. Hey, Laura, I know that you put aside a case. And it was, she called me in tears and she said, Dad, you produce more next year. So we are producing more rosé. Because what happened was, we hope to harvest, to, to crop to three and a half tons. So it's, it's very strategic how we do it. But you can't calculate in a vintage where the berry size comes in substantially smaller. So we didn't harvest th three and a half tons, we harvested 2.8. So if we wanted to produce more rosé, we would be using perfectly good Cabernet Franc. And just can't do it. So it was just one of those things. It will only happen once. 
and we will produce more next year and people won't be disappointed. It was really hard. And so I, I love the style when we started to, we've only produced rosé now for about five, six years. And at the very beginning, Alain said, uh, so John, what style, you can do a million different styles of rosé. So what style of rosé do you like? And I really know rosé because we've spent so much time in France. I said, Alain, there's one called Domaine Ode that we would drink in Provence all the time. It's just the best. And he looks at me and he says, this is my favorite. So we're totally on the same page. So stylistically, it's dry, it's bright, it's aromatic, um, but it's completely dry. And that's just something. So, so it's not a rosé sickle. It's a 12 month a year rosé. It's one you can have at Christmas with prawns because it just has that beautiful uh, energy. And I, I, anyway, I just love the rosés that he does for us. The one thing that I've, re that I've learned most apparently on this journey is there are people who know a lot, but every one of these really good experts have, are, have a kind of like a, a hyper knowledge about something. Someone will be able to pick out something unique. They'll be able to s discern whether or not you had a barrel stave in your barrel. They'll be able, there'll be a, somebody who's going to be able to pick something out. So again, it just reinforces the idea, don't cut a corner. Someone's going to find out. And, and the minute you cut a corner, there's going to be an expert who's going to know. And that's why I just said, oh, it makes my life so easy. There's no corner cutting here. I, I hope everybody kept a little sip of the icon. <laughs> No, we can tell I'm, I'm empty. Are. I'm like, can we buy a bottle now? Yes, yes, yes. I just, Rex drank all of his already. I just, I just want to say, because he drinks everything yeah. so quickly. It's like, you know. We, we've been noticing that. Yeah, yeah, it's been a trend. Yeah. Anyway, um, we want to thank you, John. Um, to you and your winery, you, this is a, truly an amazing place. And I'm glad my friends came and saw it. Yeah. The ones that haven't been here before, because this, this truly is... You know, get on the list for the uh, for the wine list because we, we, we truly love we, it. We have a guy. We have, we have a, guy. a guy. We know a guy now. <laughs> and I think it's only appropriate that we all go to south of France with him and his family. Oh. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. That's what I'm thinking, right? <laughs> now they're all best friends. Oh, uh, yeah. But I want to do a toast to, to John, guys. I don't even want That's, That's lovely. Thank you. Cheers, Mr. So really I'm honored to have had you here. Honestly, I really appreciate your coming. So I'd like to, again, thank John for his time and thank you, our distinguished guests, for coming out. I'd like to thank my, my son, Chris Connie, who uh, is doing the production of this, who's painstakingly been taking pictures and videos and recording us all. He's our editor and producer. Just dying and of course, heat stroke here. I'm good. Of course, I want to thank uh, Rex and Hank Yes. that have you know, been able to gain from my experience and love. Oh, my. Let's, let's, it's our turn to run fans yeah, so it. podcast. Yeah, right. And to the millions of fans out there, uh, we love you. Keep bringing in the, uh, the, the um, promotional funding that you're giving us because we enjoy all that wealth. And someday we'll, we'll be able to go South France and stay at a yeah. vineyard. <laughs> um, one thing I just want to say, John, Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. It's been a fantastic uh, adventure, and we wish you continued success and Thank prosperity. Thank you. No, I really, really appreciate it. I'm very honored that you're here, and it's, 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 it's really a real pleasure. So we end. Play that music, boys. Love those tunes! Mm -hmm.